we have we have a great pleasure to introduce a scholarly historian John Summers. He's been uh, featured in a number of his his articles have been featured in a number of newspapers like The Nation, and uh, he's a, a scholar from Cambridge. He's been at Harvard University. He's been at Columbia University. He's lectured regularly. Um, <clears throat> in different uh, venues, and we're very pleased to uh, bring John's per perspective as a, the perspective of a historian uh, and uh, another uh, uh, great uh, vantage point that we need to consider. And he makes us think uh, twice about what we're doing and, and poses very interesting questions and challenges that we we then can think about and, and brainstorm about and, and be good critics of what we're doing or trying to do. Uh, so I think it's very important to have his, his uh, valuable uh, perspective and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing what he has to say. John? Uh, in addition to um, Dr. Torres' uh, information and Dr. Torres' introduction, I should mention I'm also a father of an 11-year-old boy, about whom I'll speak in a minute. Um, and um, is this okay? Uh, and I'm also um, a part-time research fellow in history and disability uh, at New America, which is a think tank in... Um, headquartered in Washington, D.C., uh, and if you're not familiar with New America, I would encourage you to check out their education programs and their disability initiatives. Uh, so I should thank you uh, in advance for uh, your attention and indulgence. Um, unlike my fellow presenters, I don't have any slides or any videos. Uh, I'm going to read from a first-person essay uh, from a prepared text. Um, I'm afraid if I were to talk extemporaneously about all that our family has been through since my son Misha was diagnosed with autism, I'd start ranting or maybe crying or something. I'm a historian by training, a full-time father by choice, and a writer by necessity. Organizing my thoughts into written prose furnishes me at least with a temporary illusion of mastery, even as my format confronts me with a painful irony. Misha, who is 11, doesn't speak or write or read, at least not very much. I have to also confess that I'm not principally interested any longer in the empirical question of what interventions work, so to speak. I haven't seen much credible evidence to suggest that any work as advertised I'm concerned instead um, about the practical ethics of experimenting on children in the absence of reliable mechanisms by which to assess safety and reliability. And generally, I'm puzzled why, in the age of neurodiversity, so much research travels down a one-way street design, bifurcated by an artificial division of us and them. I read recently that theory of mind question is making a combat, comeback. Brain imaging data didn't support the allegation that autistic people have difficulty interpreting and empathizing with the thoughts and feelings of non-autistic people. Now researchers, researchers are chasing that rabbit by measuring electrical currents in autistic brains. Here's an entire field founded on a phony philosophical dualism and tested in a comically lop lopsided manner. I'll get interested again uh, when they measure the brains of my son's clinicians and teachers and postulate why they cannot empathize with his mind. How research vanguards telescope perception seems to be a neglected area of investigation. If we lift our eyes, out of the two-dimensional trenches of the clinic, classroom, and laboratory, perhaps we might discover perspective in common. 
This proposition I propose to illustrate today with a single anecdote. I don't intend to be demonstrative. I want only to suggest that we widen our conceptual aperture from crack the code approaches, that we regard the social structures where autistic children actually dwell. To the extent that these structures expropriate their chance to realize the meaning of new discoveries in science and technology, science and technology cannot be cited unambiguously as an index of progress in our field. My anecdote begins with Misha, age eight and enrolled in Cambridge Public Schools, exhibiting unusually odd behaviors halfway through his extended year summer program. The rationale for his summer program is distinct to the mode of intervention the district mandates for him. This is applied behavior analysis. It's a fancy name for behavior modification. Unlike other children his age, he doesn't attend through June and July to make progress on any particular subject area. Instead, behavior modification justifies his attendance negatively. The goal is preventing regression between the spring and fall terms. Absent a semblance of his reinforcers, behavior modification predicts, he may travel backward in developmental time. This process could conceivably reach its end point in a state of vegetation. Since Misha doesn't communicate through speech and not very clearly through any other means, my role requires a lot of interpretive labor. I grew concerned then as I observed him returning from summer school fidgety and riled up on some days and wearing a kind of hangdog look on others. A teacher's aide answers my inquiry one afternoon at the school by informing me that he's been refusing to eat his lunch. Ah, so he's hungry, but why? Maybe he doesn't find the menu delectable. It's true, the aide agrees. A piece of stale pita bread with three cubes of cheddar cheese tucked inside scarcely whets his appetite. But the vegetarian option is all that remains after he refuses his cheeseburger wraps. Now that is odd. Misha carries seven diagnoses, but nothing between heaven and earth will stop him from scarfing a cheeseburger. The aide takes me into the hallway and lowers her voice. Probably, she whispers, he doesn't like to eat his cheeseburgers served cold. Cold? Yes, the regular school cafeteria is closed for the summer. Every morning, the class lunches arrive prepackaged in milk chests with instructions for reheating the cheeseburgers. The classroom has a microwave, but the teachers have been forbidden to touch the appliance. Looking abashed, she divulges that none of Misha's classmates have been eating their lunches either. I can't say why exactly this disclosure bothered me as much as it did. We can all agree, of course, that hungry children aren't apt to learn well, but petty humiliation is rather too simple in its dimensions to state as a scientific research problem. Certainly, ethnographic research from the point of view of non-speaking autistics is sparse. I did recall recent news stories accusing school districts elsewhere of withholding hot meals from poor students over unpaid lunch, bill, unpaid lunch bills. Or maybe it was the age look of embarrassment that sent a tremor of in indignation passing through me. Kids like Misha get the makeshift classrooms the surplus desks, the obsolete curricula. Must they get the cold cheeseburgers too? Fuck that. <laughs> the rule in joining uh, the microwave, the aide went on to say, had issued out of the office of the Cambridge Summer Food Program. I walk over to the program's office several blocks away and buttonhole the director at her desk. You see, my son attends summer school. He's autistic, he doesn't talk. He won't eat the cold cheeseburgers you're sending over. No, he isn't in one of the summer camps. He's in the autism classroom at the summer school. No, he hasn't complained exactly, he doesn't talk. 
yes, the microwave functions fine. Someone in this office apparently forbade teachers from operating it. Oh, yes, comes the reply. The regular school cafeteria is closed for the summer. I know that. Well, the microwaves that remain in the classrooms belong to the food and nutrition office. And the director issued a parting edict before she adjourned for vacation, forbidding anyone to operate her department's microwaves. Very sorry, there's nothing this program can do. You might contract the district, contact the district's administrator in charge if it means that much to you. The administrator in charge oversees autism services in the district. She's also a board certified behavior analyst. She confirms to me that the microwave is the property of the Food and Nutrition Office. Well, okay, if uh, the microwave can't be used, why not let me donate one? So that Misha can end his hunger strike and his classmates too can eat properly. Nope, she says, Massachusetts state regulations stipulate that only certified food handlers may touch appliances on school property. None of the summer teachers are certified. Ergo, no microwaves may be used. This is for everyone's safety. Well, now I'm committed. <laughs> Who issues the certifications of which you speak? A vendor, she says. Serve safe, she answers. I telephone, serve safe. Yes, confirms the pleasant person who answers the phone. Our company does offer training and certification in food handling, but she struggles to follow the lengthy preamble to my request for help in getting to the root of the matter. Let me get to a supervisor, Mr. Summers. To the supervisor, I explain the, situa explain the situation. Mm -hmm. Now invoking, for reasons I can only put down to a mix of defensiveness and exasperation, certain stories and novels by Franz Kafka. A long silence follows my ex explication of the metamorphosis. Your question is bizarre. The supervisor finally breaks in. Serve safe has nothing to do with microwaves. If it means that much to you, try the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. I call the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. The department denies jurisdiction and refers me to the US Department of Agriculture, <laughs> the funder of the Cambridge Summer Food Program. The US Department of Agriculture disclaims jurisdiction as well. Was I not aware of the difference between federal funder and the local administrator of said funding? I, wasn't, I was not. Several more days of calling around finally puts me on the phone with the state's point person for the federal grant. She is the chief nutritionist of the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Our 25-minute colloquy concludes that no known rule, practice, regulation, custom, stipulation, or statute forbids the use of microwaves in this circumstance. Triumphant. I relay the good news to the district's administrator, along with a request to rescind the injunction. The administrator puts my petition on ice, as it were. She needs to sound out upper administration. A week later, I receive her email. I have been informed that teachers will be able to heat up student lunches on the days that the delivered food should be served warm, she writes, without explaining turnabout. I will email teachers now so that they know. By this time, summer school has nearly ended. So maybe this uh, rigmarole reminds you of uh, some of your own misadventures with bureaucracy. We tend to regard uh, such senseless, senselessness as a byproduct of modern life, as a Im implacable sort of and ubiquitous. Repeating one simple question, why, does tend to make one feel a bit simple, maybe even gauche. Typically, it's only when bungling of this sort emits disturbing undertones and when some procedural howler turns up their volume that the mind concentrates. I propose that we keep our minds concentrated just a little bit longer. What does the case of the cold cheeseburgers tell us about bureaucracy? Not as a byproduct, but as a mode of power. And what does that have to do with autism? All bureaucracies, of course, operate according to the principle of jurisdiction. Rules, regulations, and laws underwrite the command authority of all duly placed officials. 
In this case, nobody knew who had jurisdiction, and the requisite policy didn't exist. Yet, there could be no special favors, alas. The attitude of detachment, a principled indifference to the inner life of will, instinct, and emotion constitutes special virtues that distinguish bureaucracies. A formal neutrality denominates norms that shape and predict behavior. We see here how easily these norms of impersonality can alienate the best intentioned people. Pretty much any unofficial person anywhere in the world would instantly know what to do upon encountering a group of hungry eight-year-olds. Feed them! Misha's teachers had all the resources they needed to do what their conscience would have obliged them in every other social situation. Yet the chain of authority alienated them from their most basic predilection. I directed my indignation to the administrator in charge, the district's chief behavior analyst. Indignation draws counterparties into shared morality. But bureaucracies operate on the basis of written rules, not improvisation in a vacuum. The administrator reached for the retort of a state regulation that she supposed must demarcate microwave authority to the domain of certificate holders. This supposition turned out to be not only untrue, but a little ridiculous. Her genuflection shows us that bureaucracy must be imagined before manifesting in social fact. Teachers and clinicians bind families like mine to this very exercise all the time. Non-speaking autistics absolutely must have familiar structures, standard routines, and stable reinforcers to prevent regression, we are told time and time again. But maybe this dogma stems from the abstract needs of officials rather than from the actual needs of the children. When I informed the administrator that no written policy prevented the teachers from feeding the children edible food, she herself appeared to regress. <laughs> Reaching a state of occupational sociopathy, she needed to appeal to the celestial hierarchy of upper administration to tell her what to do. And here, if you want it, is an alternative way of conceptualizing the issue of empathy that so obsesses the theory of mind brainiacs. I hope you agree that this uh, social perspective has implications that extend beyond the horizon of the anecdote. A half century ago, findings from the social study of autism helped close the state schools and asylums. A humanitarian movement in the 60s assailed the deprivation and violence in residential facilities that we labeled warehouses or total institutions. A half century after deinstitutionalization, we might stop to ponder whether autism has been reinstitutionalized under our noses. The fusion of public and private authority in our hybrid system of service delivery renders relations of cause and effect comparatively opaque. Somehow, though, the percussive effects are no less dense. Schools deluge us with IEPs and policy packets that are about as interesting to read as a mortgage application, crammed with esoteric jargon, staggering quantities of paperwork, spell out rules and regulation that demand our informed consent. The bureaucratic mentality superintends every aspect of autism's subjective experience. Carved at the joints by medical jurisdiction, thrust into behavior modification, converted into data, and then, in due course, handed over to group homes, non-speaking autistics like Misha are assessed, audited, measured, surveilled, and evaluated constantly. Some of the most thoroughly bureaucratized humans on planet Earth pass their entire lives within the four corners of Who is principally required? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
who is principally required to take the perspective of the other party. Children like Misha expend enormous amounts of energy attempting to understand the motivations and perceptions of rule-making adults. Why can't I have an edible lunch? Good question, Misha. Bureaucracies, Graeber says, are social technologies designed to manage such lopsided structures of imagination. The production of norms absolves officials of the obligation to imagine the point of view of the subordinated. Graeber's formulation, I think, adds a dimension to the growth of positive reinforcement methods in behavior modification. The turn away from slaps and cattle prods took place over the same period that saw a major expansion in educational bureaucracy. It is now impossible to pull apart, conceptually, the methods from the milieu. In the positive classroom, spontaneity, unauthorized movement, and advantageous behavior will be ticketed as invasion of space, or avoidance, or bolting. These are administrative violations that wear the mask of clinical imperative. What did I do wrong? Why is this a problem? Good questions, Misha. The burden of asking, scrabbling for an interpretive foothold in an environment of organized stupidity is itself a form of deprivation. I expend a fair amount of interpretive labor myself, mostly trying to decipher the motives and perceptions of authorities whom I entreat for provisions it turns out that I cannot take for granted. Why not propound my own Misha-specific policy manual to save the labor? Now please turn to page 282. See here, serving temperature cheeseburgers. Yes, that's correct. Just initial the box. It's just boilerplate. <laughs> Policies are just factitious declarations of authority, interpretations of regulations that are themselves interpretations of legislation. The bureaucratic mode of power isn't natural or inevitable. It's made of contingencies that we produce by failing to confront them with contrary forms of knowledge and being. Why don't we then? Why do we surrender to the fallacy that they are scientifically ordained? Maybe we restrain ourselves because the common sense attitude of being realistic, as David Graeber points out, entails resigning ourselves to the disconcerting prospect that lopsided structures of imagination are ultimately enforced by the threat of violence. Haven't we moved past the violence the bad old days? Well, yes and no. Recall, if you will, the administrator's justification for disallowing the uncertified operation of the microwave. This is for everyone's safety. Well, this was obviously absurd. But what do you suppose would have happened if I had pushed past that absurdity with some form of direct action rather than unctuous pleading. Picture a man cradling a large electronic device outside the locked door of an elementary school around lunchtime. He has no appointment and no lanyard. He refuses to desist from his determination to warm up cheeseburgers. There's no rule against it, he cries. Well, eventually, Men with guns and sticks and tasers would arrive. Most police work, as Graeber observes, has nothing to do with solving crimes. The overwhelming proportion of situations to which police respond are conflicts over administrative rules and regulations. Bureaucrats with guns, Graeber calls them, to which we can add police are bureaucrats with guns who deploy the prediction of behavior to anticipate potential violations of norms. The doctrine of security is the point of conjunction between stupidity and violence, the place that Graeber calls dead zones of the imagination, areas so devoid of any possibility of interpretive depth that they repel every attempt to give them value or meaning. 
spaces where interpretive labor no longer works. You see, officer, my son attends this summer school. He's autistic, he doesn't talk. His name is Misha. He won't eat the cold cheeseburgers they're serving him. No, he isn't in one of the summer camps. He's in the autism classroom of the summer school. No, he hasn't complained exactly. He doesn't talk. Listen to me, there's this Kafka story. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say, I'll stop here because you know the rest of the drill. Thank you. That was amazing, John. Thank you for that testimony, which is so very common uh, among the parents that we, that we meet. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, thank you for that.